This is Luke, and what he spent his summer building will genuinely leave your jaw on the floor. Turns out a kid with a big imagination and a drive to succeed can create something absolutely mind-blowing in a remarkably short amount of time. And while kids like Luke build things with good intentions, other hyper-focused kids can be led astray into truly dark territory with their curiosity and creations. Why? Well, stay tuned to find out. From the good, to the great, to the frankly terrifying. Let's check out some young folks who built utterly crazy things all on their own. Our story begins in Iowa, 2016, with a kid named Luke Thill. School was out for summer, and while most middle schoolers would relish in the opportunity to kick back, relax, and do nothing, Luke was desperate for something to do. And oh boy, did he find it. It was then that he would first discover the concept of tiny houses while browsing YouTube, and soon became absorbed with the idea of building his very own. Now, in case you don't know, tiny houses are, according to the International Residential Code, houses with no more than 400 square feet of floor space, excluding lofts. In reality, the average tiny house treads a teeny 225 square feet of ground space, as opposed to the average regular house, which, in the USA, sprawls out around 2,273 square feet. That makes homes categorized as tiny houses only about 10% of the size of an average house. Even so, a recent study actually found that 56% of participating Americans would consider downsizing to a tiny house. For many folks, there's a certain cozy appeal in these minimalist abodes. Of course, for Luke, a mere 12-year-old, he wasn't so much concerned about housing as he was about having a cool hangout spot but there would be a long road between him and his tiny dream house as his parents drove a hard bargain. Sure, they were happy for Luke to have a tiny house in the backyard, just under one condition. He'd have to build it by himself and take full financial responsibility for it. But Luke certainly wasn't one to shy away from a challenge, so he got to hustling. From mowing neighbors' lawns and doing their chores for cash, to even foraging for recycled materials to cut down costs, Luke wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. And being the savvy young individual he is, he even managed to barter his services, which consisted of things like cleaning out garages with a couple of local laborers who in return promised to teach him to wire and carpet his tiny house. Eventually, with the materials gathered, skills developed, and an impressive $1,500 in the bank from doing odd jobs, it was time to get the tiny house show on the road. Like any great project manager, Luke had a very clear vision. The house would be a simple box shape, measuring 10 feet long and 5 and a half feet wide. The exterior would be tastefully clad in cedar shingles, and the roof would be at a slight incline with a short overhang at the front. The facade would have sash-style windows and feature a recycled steel door, courtesy of a family friend. Outside, there'd be a small wooden porch sheltered by the overhanging roof with space for flowers and plants, creating an inviting and homey environment. With a little help from Dad, Luke began by constructing the wooden frame, each piece screwed and bolted together, enclosed with reclaimed wooden walls, allocating space for a door and three windows. As a younger child, Luke often helped his dad with DIY, so he felt pretty confident using tools to string it all together. Throughout the process, he'd become way more familiar with how carpentry and electricity works, gaining invaluable life skills along the way. The fact that this kid could assemble all this largely on his own is insanely impressive. However, as he embarked on the project, it became clear that it was going to take longer than just summer break. In fact, it would be another year and a half until the tiny house was fully complete. But it was certainly worth the wait. Not to mention the hard work, as I'm sure you'll agree once you see inside. Stepping through Luke's vibrant orange door, you're immediately met with a small, yet sufficient, kitchen area, which hosts a ton of cleverly designed space-saving solutions. A very typical trope of tiny homes. For example, not only does Luke's kitchen have under-counter space, where Luke stores his mini-fridge and hot plate, but there's even in the counter space, below a hinged countertop. There's also a wall-mounted cabinet for Luke to stash his snacks and kitchenware. It's a pretty ingenious use of a repurposed medicine cabinet. 
the mirror of which handily makes the whole place seem a little more spacious. Now unfortunately, Luke's tiny house doesn't have plumbing, so as a workaround he uses a nifty little water dispensing jar which seems to do the trick. And to finish the whole kitchen area off, Luke emulated wall tiles by repurposing self-adhesive vinyl floor linoleum, which saved money, labor, and looks great. As you step beyond the kitchen, you enter the living room slash dining area. The cornered couch is not only primed for TV viewing, but also doubles as seating for a dinner table, which folds out of the wall. Using that same sense of thrifty innovation, Luke also repurposed an ornate glass door that was about to be thrown out and incorporated it into his handmade shelving unit, giving the whole space a homely touch. And what's even better is that the same shelf also functions as a ladder, allowing access to the loft level. Up there, you'll find a generous sized mattress, which Luke's dad cut from some old foam accompanied by a nightstand, a ceiling light, and a window that allows daylight to flood in. Most importantly though, Luke's tiny house isn't just well designed, but with precautions such as smoke alarms, ventilation, and fire extinguishers, it's super safe too. So what do you think of Luke's tiny house? Pretty impressive work, right? But I think the take home of Luke's inspiring story is that the smaller things in life can be just as mighty. Not just tiny houses, but little folks too, like the remarkable kid himself. While Luke's project posed countless obstacles to an initially penniless preteen, he proved that with sheer grit, determination, and tenacity, you can achieve the things you set your mind to. But as far as talented tweens and teens who've built incredible things are concerned, we're only just getting started. Not only have we got more astounding tiny homes coming up, but also mysterious underground bunkers and even a radioactive experiment that left the FBI in a serious state of panic. And every last one of these astounding creations were built by shockingly young, ingenious individuals. So once you've paid the toll of throwing a like and subscribe down below, let's get going, shall we? David Hahn. While the story of Luke Thill was sweet and endearing, this next story of a kid with an unbelievable project, I'm afraid, is anything but. In this case, what started as innocent childhood fun and curiosity resulted with truly shocking consequences. This is the story of David Hahn. It all began in the 80s with an innocent gift from David's grandparents, the Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments. This children's science book from 1961 had actually been criticized due to many of the experiments resulting in toxic and corrosive byproducts. But 10-year-old David, who was also a dedicated Boy Scout, had an innate curiosity and resourcefulness, so he was naturally intrigued by chemistry. Receiving the book was a dream come true. And well, it wasn't long until he began performing all kinds of experiments in his bedroom. Now, there's no denying David's knack for chemistry. I mean, by age 14, he'd figured out how to make his own fireworks by sprinkling powdered magnesium on a flame. More impressively, and worryingly, He'd even managed to fabricate nitroglycerin, an explosive made from glycerol, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid. But however clever David's experiments were, they were extremely dangerous, especially for an unqualified and unsupervised teenager. I mean, one time he accidentally dyed his skin a glowing orange color when he was testing methods for artificial tanning using a pigment called canthaxanthin. Because when you're a mad scientist, being exposed to real sunlight just isn't an option. Jokes aside, there was a more severe incident that occurred when he clumsily shook a bunch of phosphorus in a glass container. It quickly exploded and shards of glass were propelled into his eyes and skin, not to mention setting his bedroom on fire. Small bangs and crashes, however, had become the norm by this point, and David's inattentive and slightly apathetic mother and stepfather reportedly just allowed it to happen. Though after the phosphorus incident, David's mother made the questionable decision to relocate David's lab to the outdoor shed, a decision she would ultimately regret. With this newfound privacy, David could perform even bigger, riskier experiments which was when he had an idea, a massively dangerous idea with a truly bizarre source of inspiration. His big plan? To build a small nuclear reactor. Why? Well, because in theory, he could. How? Well, that's a little more complicated. 
This whole idea began strangely in David's Boy Scout days when he was working towards earning his Atomic Energy Merit Badge. Part of the requirements for earning the badge involved understanding basic principles of nuclear energy, building models of reactors, and, in a health and safety officer's worst nightmare, essentially playing around with mildly radioactive materials. With the nuclear seed planted in his brain, David soon developed a desire to build a small-scale nuclear breeder reactor, a type of reactor that generates heat as well as its own fuel. The danger with such a thing, though, is the risk of the reactor running out of control and spilling radiation into the surrounding areas, a hazard that had occurred even in high-tech professional facilities in the past. And this kid was building a reactor unsupervised in his shed. Yeah, just a few red flags there. Cunningly, David began gathering the necessary materials by pretending to be a physics professor. He would phone places like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, gaining information on how to build a breeder reactor and what components he'd need in order to do so. They even told him how to isolate radioactive materials. With that, David then called and wrote to various companies and agencies under his professor alias obtaining small amounts of radioactive materials. In one instance, he managed to purchase 100 smoke detectors from which he then harvested the radioactive material, a Mariusium. In addition to that, he extracted lithium from batteries, radium from antique glow-in-the-dark clocks, and even ordered some uranium from Czechoslovakia in the wake of the Soviet Union's downfall. Somehow, through willpower and deception, David, a mere 15-year-old, had gotten his hands on the components for a rudimentary nuclear reactor. It wasn't super high-tech gear, and the reactor wasn't likely to trigger the chain reaction of a full-scale nuclear meltdown, but it would be able to emit neutrons, aka the subatomic particles that can interact with the reactor's other radioactive materials to generate increasingly large amounts of dangerous radiation. All that was left to do was build it. Over the course of two years, David meticulously crafted the beginnings of his homemade breeder reactor exposing himself to potentially lethal chemicals and radiation. However, it wasn't just him being exposed to this, but family and neighbors too. Using his Geiger counter, David soon began detecting high radiation levels all the way from the shed to his bedroom. And these levels would only keep increasing as the reactor sat there in the shed until finally David was able to detect considerable radiation levels five doors down the street. Needless to say, radiation exposure can cause diseases like cancer, cardiovascular illnesses, and ultimately, death. David felt he had no option but to dismantle his contraption before the radioactivity could continue to bloom. As he dismantled and loaded the reactor's pieces in the back of his car, his curtain-twitching neighbors misinterpreted the situation and assumed he was stealing tires. Before long, the police had arrived and they wanted to search David's car. He urged them not to, explaining that the contents of his trunk were radioactive, a thousand times the normal level, in fact, but predictably, that only escalated things. David was arrested, tanked in for questioning, and with authorities fearing the 17-year-old had been developing some kind of nuclear weapon, ultimately, a joint investigation between the Environmental Protection Agency and the FBI was launched. Fortunately, charges against David were eventually dropped, though the federal authorities confiscated his radioactive materials, dismantled his lab, and buried it at a waste disposal site in Utah. While the Environmental Protection Agency requested to test David to see whether his experiments had caused him any long-term health effects, David refused. While you might assume this refusal to be checked for radiation sickness may have led to a sticky end for David, that wasn't exactly the case. The reality was that the parts of his personality that led him to carry out such a reckless, dangerous experiment, and arguably the lack of supervision from his parents, seemed to lead him down a dark, self-destructive path. This culminated sadly in his untimely demise from an excess of alcohol and other substances at age 39 back in 2016. It's a pretty tragic story when you consider his clear aptitude and passion for chemistry. Who knows what he might have achieved if only his potential had been properly nurtured. Instead, he'll always be remembered as the kid who was smart enough to be able to build a small nuclear reactor in his backyard, but not smart enough to realize how bad an idea that was. Andre Canto. Now let's focus on someone who dealt with their teenage angst in a slightly less destructive way. Slightly. As a teen, I'd often exclaim, Mom, 
you just don't get me. Which is exactly how Spanish 14-year-old Andre Canto felt when he was forbidden from wearing a tracksuit into town by his parents. Filled with rage at this fashion policing, he grabbed his grandfather's pickaxe and began smashing it into the ground in his backyard. Little did he know, however, that this would be the beginning of an eight-year-long project. Talk about, it's not a phase, mom, right? While smashing the ground might have allowed Andres to release some of his anger, it also sparked an idea. Perhaps if he kept digging, he could create his very own underground cave, where nobody could tell him what to wear, and well, over the coming eight years, that's exactly what he would do. He initially began by chipping away at it with the pickaxe. However, when a pal lent him a pneumatic drill, Andres was able to make real progress, impressively excavating 16 and a half feet below surface. During all this, Andres began to study excavation techniques and later impressively developed a pulley system to take rubble to the surface. Now, of course, this is all a tad dangerous, what with the looming threat of it all potentially collapsing, so Andres took precautions to reinforce the cave. He not only utilized repurposed concrete pillars, but also carved out vaulted ceilings, which are a tried and true way of creating an incredibly strong, weight-bearing structure, thanks to the weight-distributing properties of the narc shape. But enough about the technicalities. What does Andres' cave actually look like? While stepping down these foreboding steps might seem like the beginning of a horror film, they lead down to Andres' awesome hangout spot. With a living room, bedroom, coal stove, and even four electrical outlets, Andres' cave would make a prehistoric family very comfortable. However, when the Spanish authorities caught wind of his subterranean lair, they questioned the legality of it. But since they couldn't define it as a basement extension or storage structure, they had no grounds to reprimand Andres and his man cave. To this day, even though he's more occupied with life as an adult, Andres claims he still dedicates four hours a week to working on his cave. And even though it might attract bugs, not to mention floods during the winter, Andres' cave reminds us all to never underestimate the power of hard work and teenage rage, of course. Matt Ryan For millennials and Gen Zers alike, the prospect of being a homeowner might feel like a distant fantasy but with house prices becoming increasingly more expensive. But as we know, tiny houses may just be the answer to this, as many are trading in their white picket fence dreams for smaller spaces. And our next guy did this at just 16 years old. While most 16-year-olds are probably sneaking out to parties, not me, for I was what they would call a loser, 16-year-old Matt Ryan was building his own tiny house. Amazingly, he would complete this physically and financially by himself, funding the build with two part-time jobs. But how exactly did he do it? Well, as revealed in a video posted to his YouTube channel in 2020, he began by thrifting an old construction office trailer from Craigslist, the footprint of which measured just 8.5 feet by 34 feet, yielding 289 square feet of floor space. After tearing it down to just the metal frame, he reconstructed the interior and exterior from the ground up using wood that he'd gotten from dumpster diving. In fact, where he could, Matt made use of recycled material throughout the tiny house to cut costs down. I mean, one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? And it paid off, as all in all, Matt spent just $8,000 on his home, which is far less than you'd spend on the deposit for the average U.S. house. As you step up Matt's porch and enter the door, you're first greeted with his surprisingly generous-sized kitchen. Boasting a sink, microwave, stove, plenty of cupboard storage, and full-sized refrigerator, Matt's tiny kitchen proves that size really doesn't matter. Just off from the kitchen, the open-plan layout invites you through to the living room with a window seat couch poised for TV views. Located in the right wing of the house, you'll find Matt's bedroom and bathroom. While you might expect the bathroom to be tiny, it's actually a pretty decent size with space for full-sized amenities, such as a walk-in shower that is made from repurposed roofing material and embellished with cedar knobs. Cleverly, to save space around this area, Matt installed sliding doors, meaning the space regular swing doors need to open out into is eliminated. Onto the bedroom, and while Matt had originally intended to use a loft space as a bedroom, he didn't like the idea of having to climb to get in and out of bed, so he created a room downstairs. Not only is there space for a double bed, but also two wardrobes and overhead storage. 
And all in all, looking at the room, it doesn't feel like space has been compromised at all. Stepping up to the loft level, Matt has sneakily incorporated storage into the steps themselves, within which can be found kitchen tools and his water heater. And once you arrive at the loft, you'll see there's a snug looking lounge area primed for viewing the TV down in the living room. But when he's not relaxing in the loft or his living room, you can find Matt chilling outside either in his hot tub or on his cozy swing. Ideal for summer night stargazing. And you have to admit, the whole vibe does look pretty magical. Now, the whole project took two years to complete and wasn't ready to live in until Matt was 18. But costing just $8,000 and at such a young age, it's an incredible achievement if you ask me, and Matt should certainly be proud of what he's created. In his video, he explains how no one believed that he could do this, but as he put it, after chasing the dream for two years, he's now well and truly living it. And with Matt's dream life being shared on social media, did you know I have Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok too? Go ahead and check me out, but be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel first because, you know, YouTube is king. Now, onwards. Apocalypse Bunker. Today, 2020 might feel like a long distant fever dream comprised of Toilet Roll and Carol Baskin, but unfortunately, as we can all attest, it was very real. Stuck at home, boredom came to us all eventually, and brothers Connor, Clayton, and Bennett were no exception. Of course, the world was already in a state of disarray, but the young boys pondered on what they'd do in the event of a zombie apocalypse. That was when they had the idea to build an underground bunker. Presented on the boys' YouTube channel, Too Cool for School, they showed the entire process from beginning to end. They first began by digging a huge hole using only a shovel. And by using a simple system whereby they filled a strung up bucket with dirt, they managed to impressively dig up 10 feet. Afterwards, they then widened the perimeter of the base by about six inches, making it into a square room, just big enough to fit the three of them in. Of course, in the event of a zombie apocalypse, you can never be sure just how long you'll be down there for, so the boys carved out a little mud bench and an alcove in the wall for them to store their snacks, beverages, and a lie. More practically, though, they also carved out a footholds into the wall to allow easy access in and out of the bunker, and finished it with a trapdoor made from a wooden pallet, which, of course, would be crucial if a zombie were chasing after you. And I'm sure scrap wood would offer ample protection, right? Perhaps more practically, it also prevents anyone accidentally plummeting 10 feet. Tragically, the boys were made to fill the hole back in not long after its construction, as their parents, understandably, didn't want a giant 10-foot hole in their backyard. But boy, are they gonna feel sorry when a zombie apocalypse does happen. William Kumquamba In the modern world, we often take electricity for granted. But us privileged folk with these luxuries should remember this isn't always the case. And unfortunately for some parts of the world, electricity doesn't always come in abundance. Which is why 14-year-old William Kumquamba from Malawi in southeastern Africa took matters into his own hands and made a difference. The year was 2001 and William was forced to drop out of school. His parents could no longer afford his tuition after a crippling famine sweeping the nation had likewise devastated their family farm, which they depended on for income. This, unfortunately, is the case for many children in Africa, as UNESCO reports that 60% of African children are no longer in school by the age of 15. However, even if school was out, William wasn't about to slack off. He had big plans to help his family. With all his free time, he began researching at the local library on science and how to make wind generators. William knew that if he could just figure out how to make a wind generator, he'd be able to supply his family with some much-needed electricity. Now, in any circumstance, creating an electricity-producing wind generator would be difficult, but even more so if your only construction resources are essentially junk. Though, as we've already seen in this video, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And resourceful William used a tractor fan, shock absorbers, PVC pipes, a bicycle frame, and other bits of scrap materials to create a wind generator. And lo and behold, it worked! Incredibly, thanks to William's ingenuity, his generator was able to successfully power two radios and four light bulbs in his family's home, giving them the gift of light and music. In the years since the first windmill's construction, he has successfully led the construction of additional windmills in his village for electricity and pumping water, 
and his ingenuity even landed him a spot as a TED Talk speaker, allowing him to inspire others with his sense of vision and self-belief. But William isn't the only young person from the African continent whose innovation has left people stunned. Meet Kelvin Doe from Sierra Leone. Back in 2008, the then 12-year-old managed to build his own radio station using little more than a box of scraps. With a box of scraps! That's right. Believe it or not, Kelvin would gather scrap metal and discarded electrical parts, which he would then use to build his own mini generators, transmitters, and batteries. With a proficient knowledge of electricity, Kelvin was then able to patch together his own radio station, including a multi-channel audio mixer to run his microphone through, which he would use to broadcast to the people of Freetown, Sierra Leone. Not just that, but he even created a whole personality around it going under the stage name of DJ Focus, due to his belief that with serious focus, even unlikely seeming achievements of engineering can be made real. Kelvin also got his own TED Talk spot, so I'd definitely say to listen to this young genius's wise words. Sebastian McCarthy While as an adult, snow might not be much more than an inconvenience, as a child, there's nothing quite like it. Hours of fun are to be had with sledding, snowball fights, and building snowmen, but in 2021, 11-year-old Sebastian McCarthy took things to a whole new level. As so often is the case, it had snowed in Loyminster, Canada, and Lil Sebastian had the idea to construct five magnificent snow and ice structures. But in order to do so, he'd first need to create some snow bricks, 550 of them in fact, which he made by tightly compacting snow into boxes. In addition to these, he also made up 575 ice bricks by freezing water and foil pans overnight. Once this several day long materials gathering process was complete, all that was left to do was build. Racing against the clock before any upticks in weather temperature might melt his mighty creations, Sebastian would work day in, day out. In fact, his parents would even have to force him inside at times to allow him to warm up. Nevertheless, Sebastian plowed through and achieved exactly what he set out to do as he completed his ice kingdom. Over the two winter months that it took, Sebastian crafted five magnificent structures comprising of multiple igloos and even a 10-foot tall tower, not to mention a snow slide. And while his chilly chambers have since slowly melted away, Sebastian is already preoccupied with what he can do next in order to top himself. Perhaps an Elsa-inspired ice mountain castle? Should be light work for a highly driven young person like him. After all, insurmountable odds didn't stop the other young geniuses we've seen today. I just hope Sebastian's parents make sure the little lad doesn't learn how to make a nuclear reactor from ice. And that, my guys, is all for today. Let me know down in the comments which project you were most impressed or startled by, and be sure to like and subscribe. Catch you next time.